Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about two neurocognitive routes which we use in transport. Um, and I want you to start out by considering an object like this um, and how we would go about figuring out what to do with it or whether you know what to do with it. And you look at an object like this and it clearly has all kinds of things you can uh, figure out, affordances. You can turn the dials and you can press the keys and buttons and all of that. But unless you've been trained and are used to using something <coughs> like that, um, it doesn't have much meaning to you. You don't know what goes with what. Um, and so there are clear differences in the kinds of things you can do with this object. Some are giving you replicable vision, and some are things that you bring to bear that you know about it. So in thinking about um, how we know what to do with objects like this, our point of departure is uh, the <coughs> model with which we are now all familiar. Um, now, um, David's uh, very influential and important model. Um, but as you'll see, I hope through this talk, uh, those two roots are not quite enough to explain the variety and richness of all the things that we can do with manipulable objects in the world. Um, and I know Mel talks a lot about crosstalk between the two roots, but we're going to kind of pull that out and, and look at that, um, expand that, that crosstalk and examine it in more detail. So another point of departure for me, I was trained as a clinician, um, and uh, the, the fascinating patients that I used to see in the clinic were, were a great evidence <coughs> for, for much of my work. And we've talked today, uh, yesterday we talked about agnosia and optic ataxia. There's a third very interesting and important disorder uh, rel uh, related to action, and it's actually much more common than either optic ataxia or agnosia, and that is limb apraxia. Now, one reason I think limb apraxia gets scuttled to the side a lot is it's very confusing. It's very poorly understood. It's very confusingly described in the literature. And I, many scientists I talk to and clinicians <coughs> have sort of thrown up their hands a little bit. Like, it's weird, interesting, but I don't get it. So what, one of the things that I've done, a main point of focus in my career has been to try to unpack what this very rich syndrome is and what it can tell us about how the brain organizes cognition and action. So I'm going to start out by inviting you to see some of the things that I saw in the clinic. Uh, this is a, a, a patient with apraxia who's been asked to pantomime how to use the scissors. She knows what it is. She doesn't have object recognition. Deficits. She has left hemisphere stroke, so she has right hand weakness, but her left hand is uh, overtly normal. Now, there are subtle abnormalities and kin kinematics of the ipsilational hand in these patients, but not enough to cause what you're about to see. So, she, you'll see this sort of positioning, perplexity, um, kind of looking at her hand a lot, trying to figure out exactly what to do. Um, she, she never did this particular patient on this trial, really never does this. Now, pantomime, why do we use pantomime? Well, First of all, it's not, you don't get the constraints from the bottom up from the structure and the environment. So it gives you an opportunity to see the kinds of spatiotemporal errors that are characteristic of this disorder. Um, and you'll see in a minute what happens when she's actually able to grasp and take the scissors. Now she grasped it, grasped it just fine, but look at the trajectory. Okay, so the constraint of the object really tells you what to do, um, but there's no paper there, and so there's no other real world constraint, and you see this problem with the trajectory. That's also very characteristic. So there, that's sort of a hybrid between the top down and the bottom up. Now here's a task that um, I ran very, very <coughs> high tech. Uh, you'll see this apparatus is uh, you know, very fancy. Uh, this is a study I ran with Scott Johnson Fry, which we looked at and contrasted these patients' ability to reach out and grab objects on any trial uh, to orient their hand shape and, and wrist orientation. They didn't know whether it would be a small, a pinchable, or a clenchable object. They didn't know the orientation on this trial. This is the same hand, same patient, um, and uh, her performance is completely normal <laughs> under visual guidance. So she has this strange association here between uh, uh, knowledge-based actions and uh, visual 
So, and this has been confirmed in later studies and more, under more um, rigorous conditions with thematic analyses. Um, and another thing, I just threw this in um, last night. So this is sort of a little bit of background about apraxia. Um, uh, we were talking, Noah was talking about um, the anticipatory force control. When you are on your very first lift of an object, you grasp it with a force appropriate to its characteristics. And with Amanda Dawson, who uh, worked with David actually before she came to me, uh, we looked at uh, these patients, uh, left hemisphere stroke patients' ability to apply appropriate force on trial one with both familiar and novel objects. And interestingly, they did much worse <coughs> with familiar than novel objects. So when we did not violate size weight expectancies with the novel objects, in other words, the novel objects looked as heavy, they were as heavy as they looked, they did really well with that. So their physics knowledge of the world was intact, but, their, but the subtleties of lifting with things like a half full a bottle or a can of Coke or something like that were abnormal. So other interesting thing is that when we correlated the ranking of their grip force of objects of varying weights and correlated that with damage to various regions of of, of the parietal lobe and the posterior temporal lobe, we only had a very few observations, as you can see, but we got these very beautiful correlations. So the more damage you have to this left hemisphere uh, temporal parietal system, the more you were abnormal in your traditional <coughs> load force rate for familiar objects, but not novel objects. So this is a, this is a strange and interesting finding. The other bit of background I want to give you is uh, this sort of neuroanatomic structure uh, of the substrates of this disorder. And um, you can see here that in this study, what we did was we residualized two tasks against one another, a uh, recognition task and a production task. Um, and so what you get here are the voxel-based lesion symptom mapping, statistical maps of the lesions that are responsible for deficits in uh, action recognition uh, and action production, uh, gesture production here. And you can actually see that they start, you see this bifurcation. Here we see this posterior middle temporal region, which, uh, which has come up before. Um, and this is part of, we know this is part of the <coughs> tools uh, network, tool knowledge network. And here we see this uh, supermarginal gyrus, IFG, all along the Sylvian Fisher. Um, and MFG in, in the production task when you residualize. So if I didn't residualize, you would see an overlap between these two tasks. The other interesting thing that I want to point out here is the recognition task overlaps <coughs> substantially with area HMT plus, the human movement sensitive area in the posterior temporal lobe. So I, when I have time later, I'll go on into what I think is stored there and the format and nature of the representations that are stored in the posterior temporal lobe. This is just a um, meta-analysis by Nason et al. showing the um, voxels, the lesions that are associated with recognition deficits in black and production deficits in pink. So it's a little bit circular because my, uh, actually this paper wasn't in there. Some of my earlier papers were. So there, we're beginning to see this, um, this nice distinction here between relatively more ventral, relatively more dorsal for the uh, production of recognition. So that, well, my, believe it or not, was just my introduction, so we'll see how I'm doing. So I'm going to talk a little more about these two routes to action um, uh, between and within tool competition, time course of this tool for, uh, competition, how, bias it, how we bias competition, and um, what the architecture. Now, this is a huge, uh, looks like a huge agenda for a very short talk. What I'm really going to do is a little teaser. I'm going to kind of present maybe one study under each of these topics. Um, and we can, if we have time, we can talk more if people are interested in one thing or another. So it's just sort of a best of, greatest hits kind of thing. Okay, two routes to action. Here's an optic ataxic. Um, I wanted to show this video because I want you to bear in mind the patient you just saw who's ataxic. This is somebody who's asked to reach out and touch a pen, and she can't do it. Now, under this condition, she's actually looking at the examiner and pointing uh, in non-phobial vision. There's a lot of evidence from us and others that uh, non-phobial region is even more difficult, and that's an interesting thing. So I'll talk about later. The lesions associated with 
optic ataxia tend to be bilateral, uh, dorsal, dorsal, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, um, and, um, and I'm gonna kind of start to make sense of some of these dissociations that we're seeing. Um, so um, in 2001, I started trying to puzzle over um, these, the difference between apraxia and optic ataxia, um, and, and started to try to pull apart why we might see these distinctions um, and, and talked about these different systems that might be underlying these different behaviors. Um, and I thought about them in terms of the coordinate frame, how visually dependent and what attributes of tools. This is owing a lot to the Goodale and Miller account, just expanding it a bit. So um, uh, we, I hypothesized that there was a bilateral system that's important for moving. This, is, this is, comes right from, uh, from Dale and Miller um, and Ungerleiter and Michigan actually. Um, uh, the coordinate frame for or what we attend to, or would be a better way to put it, would be um, I'm sorry, I keep screwing up the um, That reaching task I showed you is about my speed of technology. <laughs> All right, so um, so uh, we have uh, a tendency to visual objects, um, much more uh, focus on, on uh, things in current vision, and the information is very short lasting, uh, and where the system is tuned to the affordance of the environment, whereas this use system is left lateralized, and what it acts on, what it pulls up are remember trajectories and postures, body <coughs> relative information. Um, there is a much stronger role of prediction in that system, feed forward processing. Uh, I, I won't have much time to talk about feed forward versus feed back, uh, but uh, praxis, uh, just to sort of presage, uh, have, seem to have a very strong prediction problem. Um, and, and the aspects of uh, at tools that are uh, attended to are memory driven. Now, we think in apraxia, you have the damage to this system, and so um, with preservation of that system. Okay, so that kind of explains what we get in apraxia. And then after that, that um, uh, theory, we, this, I was very fortunate because this paper <coughs> came out from Rizzolatti and Natelli uh, in the macaque, uh, spelling out that there are these, actually these two, this bifurcation of the dorsal stream into a dorsal dorsal and a ventrodorsal root. And when I saw this, I thought, aha, now, now I know what to call or how to talk about what I, what I think. Um, and then subsequently, we, uh, we published a more, oh my goodness, I'm really apraxic myself. OK. Uh, <laughs> um, we published this paper, which, um, which sort of cashed out the, the theory um, in a, in a neuro more neuroanatomic framework. Um, so I think I'm just going to stick to this since I'm so involved. So I want to, I'm just going to give you some examples of um, how some of the studies we've done in my lab that really explored the structure-based uh, tuning versus the more function-based, the more uh, memory-based tuning. So in one of these experiments uh, with former postdoc Laura Barty, we trained apraxic patients on, or left hemisphere stroke patients, some of whom were apraxic, <laughs> on um, novel ancient Finnish tools, uh, which they had never seen and didn't know what they were. And for half of these tools, we trained uh, a high afforded action. So you can see uh, a plunge. We showed patients videos with the tools over many, many, many trials and taught them to link the action with the tool. On some of the trials, the actions didn't go with the structural affordances of the tool. So you wouldn't pick that up or use that with a pinch. Um, and what we saw is that the apraxics, but not non-apraxic left hemisphere stroke patients matched for lesion volume, were significantly worse with the low afforded objects. So um, they really had trouble when the object doesn't tell you what to do. Um, and uh, while we looked at the lesions um, that were responsible <coughs> for this failure to benefit from affordances, what we saw is that the uh, medium blue is all the apraxics, okay? The 
uh, structure, benefit structure information is in green, and the overlap, that is the apraxics who benefit from structure from the high affordance are in light blue. But note that the apraxics who do not benefit from the affordances are the darker blue. Okay, so you see this, if your more dorsal regions are damaged, you can't benefit from the affordances. If they're spared, you can. So you're starting to see this bifurcation of the structure-based and more function-based root. I also might call that the move root versus the use root, grass root versus, so it's hard to know what, how best to describe it, but, but all of those things are true. Okay, now in the second part, I'm gonna move quickly to looking at competition, both within and between tool actions. So I think we've talked a lot here today, yesterday, sorry, about um, competition between different objects in the environment. And certainly that is a, a good starting place and something that's very relevant to apraxia as well, but I'm not gonna talk much about that. What I will do is start by, um, by uh, kind of contrasting the different kinds of competition that we study in my lab um, and, and how they're just a little bit of a tutorial. So if, if, I, if you see that object and you are thinking about picking it up or instructed to pick up, you can do that directly. You don't need to know anything about it. But if I say use this object, you have to first identify it, and then we think, um, among other semantic information that you activate when you think of the key, you activate the components of the action that are associated with the key. So a extended arm, a twisting wrist, wrist and a pinch hand. Um, now, because of these features, these action features, are shared between other, with other objects, just in, as in other semantic domains, we know there's feature sharing that determines similarity. Action feature sharing, we think, determines the similarity of one tool to another. And that's one of the things that we're, we've been looking at. So these, these objects share some of the features of action with, the, with that key, and what would cause between object competition when those objects are shown in the array. Now, within that key, we have competition for two, the two kinds of actions that are associated with it. Um, so now, one of the things that's interesting to think about, and we've studied mostly this kind of within object competition, <coughs> is that is it the case that the more actions there are associated with a given tool, the more competition there might be. So is it just between this grasp and use, or could it be objects multi-tool, for example, what a, you know, a Swiss Army knife? Does that, is that causing you a lot of competition? So we can look at that, um, if that's something on, the, um, on our agenda for the future years. So one of the ways we can really get at this competition issue is to study objects for which there is a conflict between the move and the use action versus those for which there is no conflict. So this pump soap dispenser, if you were putting it on the shelf or bringing it down, you would clench. If you were, if you were using it, you would use a palm gesture. So there's a con con conflict there. Um, and one of the papers in which we show that this makes a difference is a paper with Steve Jacks and other person from David Rosenbaum's lab, he used to call my lab the his David Rosenbaum finishing school or something like that. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I want you to look over to the right first, um, uh, where you have blocks of objects where you are supposed to either use or grasp, and we have um, an ABBA order, and so we also look at, at order effects. Um, our hypothesis is that Use actions are longer lasting than our grasp actions. The grasp actions, remember, are mediated by the dorsal dorsal stream and are relatively evanescent, guided by current information. We think that the use actions are more like semantic memory, which others have shown in other domains can last for many, many minutes. So if you look over here to the right and you have these conflict tools and non-conflict tools, we have initiation time, to position your hand on objects as if to grasp or use them. So it's a little bit of an artificial task, not perfect. You see that uh, regardless of the order, the, the conflict objects are slower, which cause a slower initiation time. We did a, a bunch of controls to make sure that it wasn't anything to do with postures themselves uh, that were being adopted. Objects were also controlled for other kinds of visual attributes. Um, 
Now, if you instead, and that's an abuse task, so you see this conflict effect regardless of whether uh, you grasp or uh, use first. In a grasp task, if you grasp first in an early blocks, there is no conflict effect. That makes sense, right? You're not necessarily processing the nature or the uh, semantics of this object. You're going right for the structure. Boom. By the way, you have goggles that clear, um, and you suddenly have to go. Um, whereas if you have used those objects first, then you see a conflict effect even in grasp. So what, even in grasp blocks, the use, is, the fact that the use is conflicting is going to cause interference. And that's lasting, that's bleeding into your, into your grasp block, okay? <coughs> Long-lasting competition from use. Now, the other thing that's interesting is those patients, praxic patients, are markedly abnormal um, on this task with conflict objects. So uh, these are two, two uh, cases uh, where they just have to show how, how to do it and look how inaccurate they are on these conflict objects. Okay, so we know that they're, we think that they're subject to high levels of competition. Now, what, I wanted to show you the characteristic behaviors and what happens to these patients when they see these conflict objects. I'm going to show you a video. So, in this task, patients, this is with Christine Watson, a former postdoc. Um, we, we had patients pantomime, had to use these objects, some were conflict objects. And here's what a patient does with a conflict object. This is very good. She looks at her face. She knows that it's she not knows. right. She knows. She knows. She really knows. And she keeps trying and trying and trying. <coughs> now, we've done recently, I'm not going to talk about some very interesting work that shows that uh, the degree to which they, these patients can correct their errors is a function of their own action recognition scores, the ability to recognize others' actions. So if they have good recognition of others' actions, then they can look at their hand and co eventually correct the errors. They're using this slow, effortful feedback period. So monitoring and correction is extremely interesting in patients. Um, okay, and here's the disparity between the conflict and the non-conflict tools again. And the lesions that are associated with these, um, with these patterns, first just look here. This is um, exactly what's interesting what Mel showed yesterday with the agnosic patient. These patients aren't agnosic. This is PMTG. This is anterior IPS. This is the, the um, lesions that give you a hand posturing problem with these objects, both conflict and non. But here is a, a, a conflict controlling for non conflict, residualizing out the, the non conflict. And you can see this system here, which is an SMG and IFG. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but, but just to let you know, we think this system is really important for buffering and selecting the uh, object appropriate action. When it's lesion, you can't do it. Now, another thing that has uh, influenced my account is Paul's uh, model. Um, and, um, and because it's one of the few neuroanatomically uh, cached out models of, of action selection. But you know, Paul, I, I put this down yesterday, I don't know if you can read it, walkable branches and reachable berries. Paul was talking about how, um, how the monkey, um, uh, how affordances compete. But of course we do a lot more than uh, grabbing branches and reaching for berries. So I decided to add this, which says graspable cell phones and movable keyboards. So what we need to do is kind of expand the, the idea of how we do or affordance selection and think about the different kinds of actions. And this is not a very fancy model. It's really just a framework on which to sort of hang our ideas. Um, you can find it, um, it just published last year. Um, so uh, this is a really a summary of what I've talked about, the use system in the posterior temporal lobe. Uh, the move system is in the more dorsal stream. And then you have this system here, which we call the action selection system. The SMG accumulates action competitors. By the way, interesting for those who study language, SMG lesions are also associated with a lot of phonological competition. There's, a, there's some interesting parallels here between praxis and language, of course, they're both left lateral eye 
and the IFG, of course, we see over and over again as an important foot bias in competition. Now, in the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the time course. Yeah, okay, time course of these actions. Um, and I can see already I've been able to get through them. Um, so, um, conflict objects allow us to test the hypothesis of different time courses. Um, and I already told you about those. So, this is a series of uh, some eye tracking studies that we did with Charlene Lee and Dan Merman. Um, and in this, we use the visual world paradigm that's pretty well widely used in eye tracking. We have a target object on each trial that's a conflict object. And um, on, some block, on some trials, we have a use distractor. So, this is a a remote or a TV. This is a car key fob. Uh, so they have different functions, but they have similar uses. And then we have other visual distractors. Uh, this is uh, these are visual distractors. We have non-related distractors. And just to orient you, uh, we're interested in looking at the difference between between gaze, eye gaze, to the use-related competitor versus the unrelated visually similar competitor. On other trials, we have the same kind of conflict object as target, and then we have a grass competitor. Uh, and again, we're interested in the difference between the grass competitor and the uh, visual competitor. And what we're looking at here are the differences between eye gaze fixations over time to the competitor, the use of grass competitor versus the unrelated, and that difference is what's of interest. So first I'm going to show you neural, that's the uh, orienting slide up there. These are uh, in neurologically intact participants. We see these characteristic differences in the time course of eye gaze, the uh, grasp to move uh, competitors are looked at much earlier and then uh, look, not looked at much later. Whereas the use competitors, there's a, a slower buildup of gaze to the use competitors and it's longer lasting. So throughout that trial, people make gaze. Now, by the way, this is all implicit. If you ask these patients, or do they know they're looking at the competitors? They do not know that. So, so this sort of validates the idea that there are differences in the time course of activation. Um, now let's look at what happens in the stroke patients. Here I've actually plotted the, both the unrelated and the competitor in, um, in white and in red, the non-apraxics. Uh, when this is the time course of their looks to these competitors, um, they, their peak uh, look is about 1,500 milliseconds um, after the start of the, of the trial. And they get a preview, by the way. The apraxics have a delayed look to these competitors. So there's a significant difference. When we do curve fitting here, they're significantly slower to look at the use competitors. And the lesions associated with this abnormal pattern are in the SM shape. Recently, a paper, there's been several papers about the SMG and an action selection. Here's an example. If you, if you um, zap the SMG, you reduce the ability to, to orient the hand correctly for use. So we know this is a region for, for action selection. Now, I'm going to tell you about an ERP study. I admittedly don't, I'm not an ERP researcher. I luckily enough worked with um, Charlene Lee and Kara Fettermeyer. And what we were able to show here is to validate with another method that we see differences in the time course of activation. This was a priming study. I won't go into the details. I will just say once again that we get a much earlier um, sensory, uh, one in 200 millisecond uh, ERP responses to grasp related primes, uh, later in 400, which is the semantic signature to the use related primes. And we also see differences, I think you can just look down here in the, um, in the uh, uh, locus of the um, distribution of the uh, electrical signal for use pairs, as opposed to other kinds of semantic information. So while we think this has characteristics of semantic information, it looks like it may have a different neuroanatomical distribution and be more anterior. Now here's my quick obligatory photo of my kid. Um, this is a few years back, and a cute cat. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I don't know how much do you have, like, what, three or four minutes left? Uh, yeah, sure. All yeah. right. Okay. So, just many of you know the seminal work by Ellis and Tucker, um, you know, any number of studies, what they, what they have shown. Um, uh, importantly, is that unbeknownst to you, when you're performing an unrelated task with objects, like semantic judgments, 
but the way you convey your response is via um, an action, then there's a compatibility effect with the type of action that the object affords and the action that you're using to produce your response. So for example, here where there were, where you had to decide if the object was uh, natural or manufactured and you did so with a precision or a power grip, then you saw compatibility effect with the real size of the object. This has been replicated and it's very interesting. But you know, one of the conclusions from this work, and maybe this is now a straw man by now, but um, many people still believe that manipulable objects are recognized via access to manipulation features, which is all very interesting in of itself. But the, it really begs the question, if you go around the world being activating everything at all times and being bombarded with, with all kinds of action information, I don't think that would be very effective. So one of the things we wanted to show is that the scene in which you show objects has a big effect on these kinds of activations. So we were, um, um, uh, Tucker and Alice were kind enough to um, send us one of their apparatuses, which affords pinching and clenching. Um, and on each trial, subjects would see a scene like this, and an object like this, a kitchen timer would be presented on some trials in a drawer, which affords a move action or on a shelf or somewhere movable versus in a functional context, which affords a use action, which in this case would be a pinchable. So the action evoked by the objects is different. So this, we see the scene that a blue box would come around telling you to respond, is the object natural or manufactured? They responded via punch or pinch response. And we get a crossover of the Tucker Ellis effect where in the pinch context, the use actions, in the use context, I said that wrong, uh, where pinch is afforded by the objects, you're faster to pinch than to clench, and going the opposite direction for the um, for the uh, clench actions. So we're beginning to be able to show that context influences um, these kinds of things. Now, last but not, hopefully not least, we wanted to we want to get at this question of how these objects are organized, how there's feature overlap that determines their similarity. And so what we did with healthy subjects is we had them sort objects into piles based on their action similarity. So they were overtly uh, able to think about that. Um, and then we used multi-dimensional uh, scaling. Uh, and what we found is that we got these clusters of objects, which we could later label. Um, and they, we found that there's this cluster here that are operated by their hand, mostly by hand action. So these are things like spray bottles and and staple removers, this is Christine Watson's work, by the way, very beautiful work. Um, here we have an arm action cluster. These are things that are used with a big arm action, like a paintbrush and a, uh, um, and a potato peeler. Uh, and then we have this, we have interesting prehensile, non-prehensile distinction, which is why when Susan um, was uh, doing the, talking about this with her, uh, her kids, um, I, I think that may be a very important distinction between things like soap dispenser and hole puncher and, and, and a toaster and, and prehensile objects. Um, now, that's nice, but is that real? So in order to validate that, we did a blocked cyclic priming study in which we are, people are shown blocks, and in each block there are the same objects shown over and over and over and over. And the objects could either be very, very similar in action, in close in, but drew them close from that space, or they could be sort of moderately dispersed or very dispersed in the action space. On each trial, they can see a word and then simply do a word picture matching um, and uh, point to the, um, lift the a key press and, and point to the, um, the target. Um, and um, what we expect from other block cyclic uh, literature in the language domain and the semantic domain is we expect this competition uh, effect to be mediated by semantic distance. Now, no one has, uh, Tim uh, Shalas ha actually had a study similar to this, but did not separate out use and grasp actions. So it wasn't clear what was driving his effects. These are use uh, similarity effects. And we see that in the um, high similarity blocks, people are a lot less accurate than in the moderate and the low. So we're able to start to see a gradation as a function of how far apart in action feature space these objects are. Okay, that's, that's it.
what I've shown you, I've talked to you a little bit about limopraxia very quickly. There are subtypes of, I didn't get into, you can ask about that if you want. Um, we know that between and within tool competition has particular relevance for praxia. We know that use actions are slower activated and longer lasting. And we know that that activation speed influences competition. So there is a horse race going on. Um, and depending on the task constraints and how you, whether you move quickly or not move quickly, you're going to be able to see a difference here. Uh, we know that goals, task goals, do influence this activation. And then we are starting to look at uh, how these tool action representations are organized. I want to just say we don't really quite know whether that is a visual. Do they look, do these actions look more or less similar? Are they more or less similar motorically? So that's one of the things that we have to unpack, or probably both, um, but we don't know yet. And that's it. I want to thank you. This is my lab. Thank you, NIH and Donald, and a lot of my recent collaborators. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for uh, a lot of great information. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, well, we have time for some. Uh, we have some time for some questions. And uh, just remember, we're going to be using the microphone uh, just for the benefit of the people on on this set. Um, as interesting as both are, I think that the last two studies kind of contradict each other, uh, and I think that's a very important issue of whatever your solution to it. Because the idea of the last study is that there is uh, features of features of features, uh, and the having of them in the mem in memory is sufficient to play around with it experimentally. That is, you can count on all features that there are, and that's allow that allows you to to open this landscape of feature uh, similarity and so forth. However, the the second to last study suggests that features are not features are not features necessarily because they are different, differentially activated in different task contexts. So the, just the having of a feature is irrelevant in the strongest case, if not primed, if I would call it, mm -hmm. by the context or the actual mm -hmm. goal, which but is a context. I don't so see I those as contradictory though. So the last study, the block cyclic study, what I think is happening there is you have to appreciate how many hundreds of trials these people are seeing. And I think your brain is a statistical organizer. So it's computing the similarity implicitly. It's being primed. You can, you know, priming doesn't mean though that every time you walk around in the environment, everything's activated. But it does mean there should be a recency effect. So if you're going to reach for one bottle, you may have you may be primed to reach for another similarly shaped and size or use one thing. So I don't, I don't necessarily, what I, I don't think they're contradictory, but I do think it begs an exploration of the boundaries. Of to, to get back to the, let's say, the language that I used in my own talk, mm -hmm. uh, if I may, uh, I think that I, 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 I fully agree with your acquisition statistics logic. I do think the brain is, is picking up all these features if just perceivable and recognizable and so forth and so on, because it never knows when it will need them in the future. But the retrieval, and this is what is being tested in these similarities or in any, in any experiments, we are always uh, relying on retrieval. If you have the feature stored and you're not using it, then we cannot find any effects of it. And you rely on them, and in the, in the, in the clustering study, you rely on the activation. And the, the previous study showed that you cannot rely on the activation irrespective of the context. So I think what you're getting there is a kind of stereotype, is the most common features mm -hmm. that people think of. And given your context, relatively context-free test of this mm -hmm. matrix, mm -hmm. uh, you get what you put into. But that's not necessarily a true exhaustive map of what people have. Uh, in order to get there, we would need to activate all, we would need to get through all the context and all the possible goals and then do the same thing. So I, I, it may still be very useful, uh, but uh, we should not be surprised to find sometimes not find effects of the features that you find and sometimes not find all the features that people have. That's right. That's, all right. I, that's fine. That's fine. I just think what you have. I, I, so this space of the, of the kinds of studies that I'm doing are not, there's not a lot of company 
um, in, in the research world for this kind of yeah. study. So we have a few studies here and there. I think it's very early. What I would love to see, and what, whenever I give talks, I'm hoping to interest people more in studying skilled action and explore these boundaries of what are the conditions. I don't, it seems to me you're criticizing this as, or as being somewhat artificial or that, the, that these are sort of exploratory, you know, a laboratory tasks which may or may not have real relevance. So, but at any rate, I think understanding better what is activated when and what, what is automatic, what it, you know, I think that needs to be done. And so I'm hoping others will join. Maybe we can have one more question. Um, I, I was uh, interested in, in the fact that the, the tool use pathway is, is central to the transport yeah. the pathway, um, which, which agrees kind of with that Graziano idea that I showed in my talk where you have sort of um, action specific pathways in the brain and, and you know, that sort of brain stuff to mouth and manipulate um, seems to be more ventral. And so I'm wondering whether tool use, which evolved out of, out of things like manipulation, it, 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 for that reason, it lies there on that, on that sort of core of the map. It, it lies, it was a specialization within the hand uh, region. But tools, and, and of course, most tools are about the hands. They're used with the hands. Right. Have you thought about, though, first of all, is it even, is it even reasonable to think about tools that are not the hands? Um, and they also make use of that same um, sort of hand related. That's an interesting. Hatch. Or is it like, I, I don't know what, what I, you know, I, when I was trying to think about this question, I thought to myself, I, I, I need to give an example of a non hand tool on that. So, for instance, uh -huh. so, well, so, is soccer ball. Or, yeah, industry. sure. Or like the old fashioned mm -hmm. uh, sewing machine that you used yeah. to operate oh, with yeah, a foot yeah, pedal. That's a good, that's a good um, yeah. But we've looked at, you know, lower limb apraxia is this is um, rarer, but you see it in uh, bigger strokes and uh, it may have some homotypy. It may be related to the, to the leg region, which is more mesial. So when you have bigger strokes that are much more dorsal, you tend to get leg, leg apraxia as well. But going back to this, the tools are not only, I mean, tools and language and communication are, are very closely related. Hand, uh, hand actions and mouth actions, which are very difficult from a, sort of an articulation, motor planning, motor programming perspective, are very closely related. So, um, and I think one reason the tool use system is more ventral is it has to draw on, it's more memory dependent. Things that are more memory dependent are, in, at least in the tool system, are more inferior. There's big uh, connections between um, Harry hippocampal uh, regions and um, and the posterior middle temporal gyrus. So uh, I I think it all evolved together. Communication to use. People talk about bipedalism, being you know, uh, able to free up the hands. I wonder what and, some of the problems here you're showing that are kind of particular to the, to the tools um, would be would be present in a more leg related region. Would you have a, a, a tool use subsystem within the leg region, or would it be yeah. Yeah, I don't, I think it wouldn't be there. I, um, some of the work, uh, Marius Peel and uh, um, Alfonso Carmazza and others, um, uh, and Jason Gallivan, um, have shown that this, there's this tool and hand preferring region in the posterior middle temple. I don't know, Mel, do you know if they've ever looked at feet? <laughs> I don't think so. So, but I, I just, uh, that, that's a really interesting question. You should try it. Thank you. I think uh, for, for the sake of discussion, I, um, I want to keep it going. We we have a, a, one of our speakers uh, was unable to join for our next wow. session, so so I'm gonna again use my chair's prerogative a little bit and say let's <laughs> let's continue the discussion a little bit, spill over, and, and oh, okay. Emma, if, if um, um, oh great, let, let uh, anybody have a question. I like the emphasis on use. I'm sorry, on use. It's gonna be short. Um, but the some of the stimuli. It seems still that your use description is rather abstract, somewhat kinematic. Yeah. And in some of the stimuli, it seems as if the dynamics of use are quite different. And I wonder if you have a partial atmosphere that seems there are different 
hand, for example, yes. in a bottle opener, the only time I would try to use one hand to open a bottle, uh, that'd be very well, if you were to try it that way, it would be very effective. So in many actions, your left hand is support, or your other hand mm -hmm. is support, mm -hmm. and, and they're really two-handed use of objects right. mixed into this movie. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. Have you ever commercialized that on the table? No, but... Uh, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, let me address the kinematic versus uh, the sort of the temporal, spatial, the temporal versus the postural. So we do have, I can show you a slide. I won't bother because uh, there's Heather's are already up. But we, we, um, we have looked at this and the kinematics of action tend to be much more frontal parietal. Uh, so when people make errors in the, kin in the kinematics really meaning the, the trajectory, the um, and the timing, uh, amplitude and timing, sorry, it took me a minute to get, amplitude and timing are frontoparietal, postural tends to be, hand posture is much more posterior temporal. Those tend to separate out a little bit more. Um, with regard to the two-handed versus one-handed, have not looked at that. There is some very interesting work, though, um, suggesting that, um, Indeed, the, the left hand is specialized for stabilization and the right for trajectory planning and uh, commensurately the, the right hemisphere for stabilizing the left for trajectory planning. Um, but I think that would be a fun, very interesting thing to look at. Thank you.